Hello friends, Andy here for What Culture Wrestling and today we're going to have a nice wee chat about one of the sport's absolute favourite topics, Hulk Hogan, a guy absolutely everybody has a strong opinion on. So strap yourselves in because we're going to break down his Netflix movie. Certain stories in wrestling deserve the long read treatment. It's a carnival of incredible characters sometimes extending beyond the gimmicks and their journeys ought to be told. For example, how good would it be to see Vince McMahon's story told in the style of the social network? Or how about China's story? Or even something like the Benoit tragedy? Each of these would be great in their own different ways and they deserve the same platform as Paige's Fighting With My Family. And the next one we're going to get via Netflix is on Hulk Hogan and the rise of Hulkamania. Now this isn't inherently a bad thing because Hogan is a cross-cultural figure who is largely responsible for wrestling's mainstream crossover. Thanks, Mr. Nanny. But he's also a divisive, controversial figure whose most compelling storyline played out in a real-life courtroom against a media conglomerate, and then on the internet's own digital courtroom. He was embroiled in a racism scandal, and it all happened in a very short space of time. Now, take this situation and imagine it playing out in the style of something like American Crime Story. It's so intoxicating, you have to wonder why it hasn't been made yet. Instead of that, we're getting Netflix's take on Hogan at the height of his powers, starring Chris Hemsworth. Now that is a bold casting choice, but you know, if you add a few hairs to the Aussie's head, he does kind of start looking like a younger Hogan, albeit a bit more sexy. On paper, this should be a good watch, but there's a couple of problems here. Putting Hogan being an inherently problematic figure aside for a second, the real issue here is that he is said to act as both a producer and a consultant on the film. He's writing his own history, basically. This has always proved an interesting choice when it comes to biographical features like this, and with Hogan, well, it's an absolute bloody minefield. This is a guy who has always been economical with the truth, and even more creative with it. So let's begin with the issue of biopics being sponsored by their real life stars, and specifically Bohemian Rhapsody, which caught a lot of heat for the way it presented its subjects. And that was largely down to the surviving members of Queen acting as producers with script approval. If they hadn't been in that role, we would have got an entirely different version of the film, with Sasha Baron Cohen starring as Freddie Mercury, and an entirely different story focusing on some of the other aspects of Queen's rise to the top. After leaving the role, Cohen pretty much shot on Queen, calling Brian May a great musician, but a less than great producer. Now the band have since said that Cohen wasn't the right man for the job because one, he was distracting, and two, he wasn't taking the role seriously enough. But Cohen has since said that he had a number of other stories that he wanted to tell in the movie surrounding Queen, and I quote, there are amazing stories about Freddie Mercury, the guy was wild. There are stories of little people with plates of cocaine on their heads walking around at a party. But they didn't include that because they wanted to protect their legacy as a band. Cohen also revealed what their approach to the story would have been had their original plans played out, and get ready for this one because it's quite a long quote. A member of the band, I won't say who, said, you know, this is such a great movie because it's got such an amazing thing that happens in the middle. And I go, what happens in the middle of the movie? He goes, you know, Freddy dies. I go, what happens in the second half of the movie then? He replies, but we see how the band carries on from strength to strength. And Cohen replied, Listen, not one person is going to a movie where the lead character dies from AIDS and then you carry on to see how the band carries on. So there you go. So obviously, Cohen's second quote there seems to have gotten through to the band because they did not follow through with their plan to kill Freddy off before the second half of the movie. But they did have a major say in how the legendary frontman was portrayed. Queen were some of the most notorious hellraisers in music history, and if you want to believe that Brian May and co were sitting in the background sipping tea and tutting affectionately while Freddy was raising hell, you probably don't know the truth of the band. But who's to say anyone really does? The point the point here is that they controlled their own story. The only people who are incapable of telling their own stories are those who've passed away. Now, Mercury obviously didn't have any influence into Bohemian Rhapsody, and that's why he comes off as a much more complex character than those employed to fill the role who do a good job and look the part, 
but don't necessarily have deep characters per se. That's an issue with all biographies presented around people who are still alive, because like Queen, they have a vested interest in preserving their own legacies. For example, there's no way that the upcoming Rocketman film will be half as revelatory as fans are hoping for, because, well, Elton John is still around to question the approach. As we know, history is written by the victors, and fame well, that's written by those still living it. Now, that's not to say that somebody else couldn't have made a truthful, accurate film about Hulk Hogan while he's still alive, because it is very much possible to do so without becoming a psychophant. But it would have been a whole lot easier without so many people interested in preserving his image. And it would also be a heck of a lot easier if Hogan himself wasn't the filter through which all this history is going to be run. Hogan has been installed as effectively the gatekeeper to the true story of what happened as he rose to prominence and effectively invented mainstream wrestling. And if you think that's hyperbole, wait till you see how the marketing campaign stacks up over the coming months and years. Hogan's situation is actually a lot more complex than Queen's as well. I mean, sure there's going to be Hogan and those around him having their influence, taking out anything that they feel portrays Hulk in a bad light, but there's also the issue of how Hogan sees his own life. As suggested in the man's Gawker trial, Terry Bollea does not live the same life as Hulk Hogan. Terry Bollea doesn't even have the same penis as Hulk Hogan, and yes, he actually said that in a court of law. Good. Hogan is a fictional construct built by Terry Bollea to project the perfect image of the job he was supposed to be doing. When they needed an American hero to save wrestling, he invented a bronzed Adonis with a 10-inch whapper and a can-do attitude to match his pythons. And when they needed a heel, he was just as adept at adapting Hogan's story to fit. He is, at his core, a storyteller, and that goes some way to explaining the reputation he has for making some, uh, bold claims about the things he's done. Now perhaps it comes to the same my penis is massive narrative that went into constructing Hogan, but it has since been claimed that the claims he made that he was once asked to join Metallica, that the UFC once wanted him to become a fighter, and that everything he said in that goofy Hulkster in Heaven song were, well, little porky pies. And by that, I mean they were total fabrications, along with the claim that he could have played the lead role in Darren Aronofsky's The Wrestler or that he once fought George Foreman in a boxing match. Because that's the thing about Hulk Hogan, he has always been a great yarn spinner, but perhaps it's a good idea to maybe, maybe not believe everything the guy says. So if the stories I've just mentioned were all done to furnish his character and don't have any bearing on real life, then that's all well and good. Hulk Hogan might have been a thrash metal legend, Hulk Hogan might have been a UFC fighter, and hey, maybe even Elvis Presley might have been his biggest fan, despite his career and Elvis's life not really crossing over in any way at all. But Teddy Bollea, the separate person, wasn't any of these things. And if it's Teddy Bollea that's acting as the consultant, on this Netflix movie, then perhaps we have something to be concerned about. But wouldn't it be far more fitting for the story of Hulkamania to be told by its star? Wouldn't it fit everything we know about Hulk Hogan for him to be the lead storyteller here? And yes, of course Netflix will do some cursory fact-checking here, but the story of Hulkamania is nothing like for example, the story of WrestleMania. Vince McMahon put the first one on in 1985, and it took off thanks to some ingenious booking decisions, including booking celebrities, and now it's still the tentpole event on the annual wrestling calendar. When it comes to WrestleMania, there is a very firm, factual account of what happened, why, when, and how. But when it comes to Hulkamania, well, that was a construct designed to sell a character. It's entirely different. It was presented as an organic response to a superstar, but in reality, it was just another marketing ploy to whip up hype. Now, Hogan might have had bags of promise when he was wrestling in the AWA, but there was no mania attached to him not until WWE said there was. In reality, Hulk was pushed into the main event scene despite the likes of Bob Backlund complaining loudly about him not paying his dues. And in the end, his rise was accepted because he was riding the wave of Hulkamania. Now there's a lot of nuance to that story, including the idea of how Vince McMahon basically conned an entire fan base into the idea of superstardom on insistence alone. But that's not likely to be what this Netflix film is going to be. This, rather more strangely, might be Hulk Hogan's account of what actually happened. Hulk Hogan 
the character. It'll be a shame if this manipulates or ignores the truth, because the true story of how WWE perfectly played their audience into expecting something historic by giving them something that would then become historic is one hell of a thing. But then again, so is the image of a guitar-wielding, UFC-fighting, real American, brother. And that, my very good friends, is that, a complete breakdown of the real problem with Hulk Hogan's upcoming Netflix biography film. As usual, I'm curious to know what you guys think, and I know each and every one of you has a lot to say about Hulk Hogan, whether good or bad. So go ahead and let us know what you reckon of the film itself and Hogan's involvement in its production down in the comments below. Once you've done that, don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and once you've done that, go ahead and check out the fantastic article on which this video is based, written by our very own Simon Gallagher. The link for that will be somewhere down below, and for now, I I've been Andy, and I'll see you later.